All right, here is our second lesson of Unit 5, uh, discussing the causes and effects of the Spanish-American War and the extent that it either unified and divided the United States as a nation to, at the same time. Uh, roots of the Spanish-American War lie in revolution and revolutionary attempts in Cuba. Uh, way back into 1868, uh, Cuban rebels declared independence, uh, launched a guerrilla warfare against uh, Spain to try and break away from that uh, empire, imperial country. Uh, it collapses, uh, and many of those revolutionaries flee to other places, uh, including the United States, one of them being uh, their leader, Jose Marti. Uh, 1895, 1896, there's another attempted revolution against Spain. Uh, revolt is partly economic in that the Wilson-Gorham tariff that was passed by the United States in 1894 uh, put a high tax on the sugar coming out of Cuba. Cuba is the sugar bowl of the world one of the most profitable, if not the most profitable, uh, commodities coming out of the Americas and uh, supplying about 90% of the world's supply of sugar. Uh, and that high tax made their sugar more expensive, put economic stress on everybody there, and uh, is one of the partial reasons for that revolt besides the desire for independence. This tariff also put a high tax on sugar and commodities coming out of Hawaii, which was still an independent republic at that point in time, but there were American and Western uh, plantation crop growers, sugar cane growers there, and one significant name you might recognize in the grocery stores still around yet today, Sanford P. Dole led some other growers uh, in a uprising against the Queen, Queen Little Colony there, and overthrows the government with the idea that they could get rid of this tax, the Wilson-Gorham tariff, uh, that put a high tax on their sugar, uh, by basically setting it up, uh, Hawaii up as a republic, and overthrowing it, and then going to the United States and saying, please annex us. Uh, and then they wouldn't have to pay the tax. And, uh, of course, they being Westerners and Americans there, that is also part of it as well, but he basically becomes the first president. And so really it's a little coup and a plot and overthrow of Hawaii. And you've read about that, so that basically that wasn't something that was supported by the people. And Grover Cleveland, uh, at that particular time, sent an investigative committee to see if the people really want to be part of the United States, found that they did not want to be, and said, forget it, we're pulling the Marines out of there and the United States Armed Forces out of there that initially helped that uprising happen. And so annexation of Cuba, or excuse me, Hawaii is on hold. The revolt in Cuba basically is one in which you have civilians, you have uh, common people trying to resist a modern or somewhat modern uh, military that is uh, had by Spain. Uh, guerrilla warfare is the method. Uh, they're weaker, they have fewer resources, they're less organized, they're less well trained, they use the natural surroundings and the environment to uh, employ hit and run tactics, they live off the land, uh, they don't have form uh, formal army uniforms, they look like civilians, and so for Spanish soldiers to see who the resistors are and who the revolutionaries are, it's very difficult and Innocent people tend to get killed, and Spanish soldiers tend to get frustrated and kill people indiscriminately, and that results in retaliation and, and all kinds of uh, violent acts uh, of and atrocities on both sides uh, that make this particularly bloody. Uh, the insurgents particularly used uh, something called scorched earth kind of tactics in which they purposely destroy uh, crops and bomb railroads, especially those that are owned by Americans with the idea that, you know, if uh, we can get Americans angered and interested in what's going on here, maybe the United States government will help us. Uh, they'll, those Americans will pressure the government to bring in support for our cause and will gain independence because, of course, Americans are all about democracy and republics, correct? Not always the driving force. Uh, America's sympathies to the Cubans do rise with this. Uh, U.S. citizens have some investments there, about $50 million, but not significant enough to get a large number of Americans concerned about what's going on in Cuba. Uh, most Americans could care less at this point, but other things are just going to start to build. Uh, and uh, one of those things that helps uh, build American interest and concern about what's going on in Cuba are the human and humanitarian events that are going on, in, on down in, in Spain. And uh, a general that's sent by Spain to put down the rebellion is a guy by the name of General Weiler. He gets the nickname the Butcher. Uh, in order to control the rebellion and determine who the enemy is and who isn't uh, the enemy, uh, with this guerrilla warfare, he sets up reconcentration camps, re relocates people into specific areas. There's curfews. You have to be in a particular area. If you're not in a particular area, you're deemed to be a rebel. And if you're a rebel and you're not in the right area, you're going to be shot. And uh, uh, it was a way of trying to prevent civilians from supporting the rebels as well. 
But basically, these real concentration camps turned into something like what we're familiar with with concentration camps out of World War II. Uh, these are pictures of some of those individuals there. Uh, starvation, disease, poorly looked after. It was uh, a humanitarian disaster. And this gets out into the news and into the world, into the world press. Uh, he's removed uh, with some American pressure to get him out of there. Uh, to try and uh, uh, settle the uh, outrage uh, that is pressuring the American government. Even go, uh, President Grover Cleveland is, is, uh, is uh, getting pressured to get involved with Cuba. And uh, he is not interested in doing that uh, because this, of course, could lead to war. Uh, again, pictures that you might more associate with concentration camps in World War II. Uh, another factor here in driving interests and informing people is this thing called yellow journalism we talked about before. Basically, writing inflammatory, inaccurate, or maybe partially accurate uh, stories to get people's attention, to get them to see things a particular way. It's propaganda. It's also a way of selling newspapers. Things that are very uh, outlandish might be written or said uh, to get people to buy the papers, but also to, at the same time, support a particular cause, in this case, the cause of getting involved in Cuba. And these two particular individuals, uh, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, Hearst uh, major uh, newspaper owners out of the Northeast of the United States, are in basically a paper war to be the most dominant newspaper in the country, but also to promote the expansionist cause. And they basically write things uh, that uh, are going on in Cuba uh, that are partially true or not true at all. Uh, again, newspapers, they are a business. They're out there to inform people, but they're also out there to make money. And they publish articles on Cuba that uh, involve atrocities like, you know, babies being uh, thrown into Havana Harbor uh, by the Spaniards uh, and fed to the sharks, things of that nature. Uh, and as readers read about this, more and more Americans get tied into Cuba and saying maybe we should do something. Uh, he has uh, William Randolph Hearst and Pulitzer both have their investigative reporters down there, uh, sent down there to report stories. Sometimes, in this particular case with this quote, uh, one of their reporters did not come back with anything. Uh, and the response is, don't worry about it. Give me a story. I'll come up with pictures and events and things like that. You just do your job. Uh, and so uh, what's being seen in the newspapers and the American uh, press, and it's kicked out by the American press, uh, for those that are concerned about and want to get involved, obviously, with this cartoon in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Cuba is that there's misrule down there, there's anarchy down there, uh, Cuba is in the frying pan, and uh, the duty of the West should be to do something about it. They're right, Florida's right in our backyard. How is it that we as a nation could just sit there and let things uh, happen like this? Uh, and uh, there are a group of super patriots and expansionists who really view that we should do something. Military invention should happen. We can't morally allow this to happen right in our backyard. Uh, we need to help them win their independence, promote independence, uh, promote republics, promote democracies, democracy if uh, development. If we don't, we're hypocrites. Uh, protect our interests down there. We have money interests. We must defend the Monroe Doctrine as well. Uh, Spain is uh, as, as a monarchy yet uh, is... Uh, basically uh, uh, acting in a way that is against our rights and our, our, our regional interests. And, of course, there's human rights issues there, to say the least. Um, and so more and more as events and information gets reported out on the, in the newspapers uh, and the expansionists and the yellow journalism uh, 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 is, is printed, uh, we get more and more people involved in and concerned about what's going on in Cuba, but not enough to go to war. When President McKinley gets elected in 1896, he's really strongly opposed to war. He's a Civil War veteran. Uh, he was very much uh, criticized by the super patriots and humanitarians. Uh, he's getting a lot of pressure to expand and get involved there, uh, and he's going to have to give in with events and events that are kind of uncontrollable. Unexpected event number one, the DeLone letter. Uh, this is a letter spent, sent uh, back to Spain from the uh, foreign minister of Spain, Enrique DeLone, that is uh, uh, somehow intercepted and leaked out into the United States press that basically criticized McKinley and called him a weak, uh, weak fish, basically. He's weak, he caters to rabble, low, on, low class people, uh, and he's a low politician. So this gets out into the media and the yellow journalists and super patriots go crazy with this. You can't criticize the American president like that. Uh, and uh, this is intolerable. We need to do something. Mr. President, Mr. McKinley, you're a spineless, you're a coward. This is basically uh, what uh, Mr. 
uh, Teddy Roosevelt told him. He was t secretary of the assistant secretary of the Navy at the time. Um, but uh, no one else can criticize their president. And then we have with this uh, Mr. McKinley sending down the uh, battleship uh, USS Maine from uh, Florida to Cuba into Havana Harbor to basically show that he's taking action and to be there in a time when it, at that time it was, being, uh, was getting uh, more violent and to uh, be kind of a, a visible show of force a little bit and as well to maybe be there to help Americans that are there and protect their their lives and their safety at that, that time. And so McKinley sends this ship down there to try to show that he's doing something and uh, to encourage me to maybe try to fix things there and sell things down. Not more than a couple weeks after it's there, uh, it explodes in a massive explosion, killing the vast majority of, of sailors there. It looks like this. Uh, and uh, immediately it comes out in the newspapers and the press and statements by expansionists like Secretary of, uh, of, of the Navy, Roosevelt, say uh, this explosion was not an accident. Obviously then it must have been the Spanish who did it, guilt by association uh, and reward and things like that. And this, with all the other things that have happened, get Americans outraged. And of course, this must be the fault and the work of the devil Spaniards. So this sparks and brings about our war. Uh, investigations years later, several investigations and pulling up the actual ship showed that it was an explosion that was not from the outside but the inside. Uh, somehow there was some heat that uh, by the boiler room or uh, the, uh, a room in the ship that had the explosives uh, and gunpowder, uh, a wall or some Heat was generated near that and it caused it to explode, causing it to explode inside out. It was an internal thing. It was not an external bomb or a land mine, a, a water mine or anything like that. It was just an accident. And uh, But nonetheless, this event brings about the declaration of war. It's debated in Congress. There becomes a, a division within Congress in the country whether we should go to war or not. Expansionists want to go to war for obvious reasons, they say, and anti-expansionists feel that this is a war to go out and grab land and grab territory. And uh, we declare war, and the amendment that is added to it that it's important to know is called the Teller Amendment. And uh, basically this says that Cuba will be independent and not annexed. We'll go to war as long as we go to uh, the war for the right reasons to give them their independence. And this is declared on April 25th, 1898. All right, and so factors in war, uh, strong public opinion against war, but as events and things happen here, things become too numerous and too heavy to keep us out of war and public opinion gets shifted in the other direction. As the war happens over in the Philippines, uh, not only does Spain have uh, Cuba as uh, a uh, colony, but they have the Philippines as well, and the Philippines uh, basically are uh, a colony for the last 400 years. They've tried at about the same time to break away in revolutionary events uh, and attempts. Uh, one of their leaders, Emilio Aguinaldo, was kicked out to Hong Kong on one failed attempt, and the United States has uh, a uh, fleet uh, based in Hong Kong, which is also a British port at that point in time. And uh, a message is actually sent to uh, Hong Kong and the Admiral there, Admiral Dewey, by Secretary of uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Teddy Roosevelt, to uh, basically sail to Manila and attack Manila in the Philippines, this is without the president knowing, uh, when war breaks out or if war breaks out with Spain. And uh, send the message also, find that Aguinaldo guy, we'll help you gain your independence if you help us take the Philippines. And so the Filipinos are promised independence. Uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, kind of a philosophy there. And so this then brings about a few months later, uh, once war is declared, this question of annexation of Hawaii becomes a reality. Hawaii is now necessary as a stop-off point across the Pacific. It's about right in the middle uh, to be a connecting point to get over there and wage war against the Philippines. Uh, and this is what brings Hawaii into our control and into our territory. So sovereignty transferred there by joint resolution of Congress. Uh, also, big sugar plantations, uh, fruit plantations there. Uh, we can see that this is something that helps grow the sugar, sugar economy for the United States as well and the sugar industry for the United States as well. So there's a lot of economic benefits to this as well, this splendid little war. Uh, the war is very quick. It's very short. I think the actual fighting and shooting is about three months. The United States is very unorganized. 
uh, and it's chaotic, but the Spanish Navy and military is very much antiquated compared to the United States. And of course, they're coming from a very far distance, and the war ends very quickly after about uh, less than a year. Treaty of Paris is signed in 1898. Uh, in it, it's very generous to the United States. Cuba is free from Spanish rule. The U.S. gets Puerto Rico and Guam as the actual territory. We still have them both today, and the U.S. pays Spain $20 million for the Philippines. This is going to bring about the question about what to do with the Philippines. President McKinley uh, will have several options and people throwing different ideas at, at him as to what to do. He didn't even nearly know where they were to begin with, even before the war. Um, choice one, give, uh, give them back to Spain, but this would not be honorable. Uh, we won them fair and square. This is what happens in wars. If we give the Filipinos their independence, uh, we may have them fall into anarchy. There's nothing organized there. They've been a colony too long. They don't have educated leaders. Uh, we can't let them go right away and to be vulnerable to Germany or to some other European country taking them over. So that would be like throwing them to the wolves. Uh, that wouldn't be beneficial either. And, uh, but if we take them on our own, you know, maybe we're looking too much like uh, some of these other dictators, Napoleon or Caesar or a controlling imperial uh, force. Is this what democracies do? And there is an actual anti-imperialist league that forms here at this point in time. They would say that th this is too costly. Uh, it's going to uh, require a larger military. It's going to violate the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's uh, anti-democratic. It's going to bring in lesser races of people here. Our nativism is kind of speaking here as well. And of course, job competition. If they become part of the United States, they're going to be intermixed into our economy and be a, uh, a cheaper labor force. Uh, but at the same time, imperialists said, you know, we've got economic potential here. We've got the opportunity to extend our sales and grow markets in Asia, China. Uh, it's the white man's burden to go ahead and lift and grow these people and help them be, become independent someday. They're little kids right now. Let them develop. This is good for industry and the economy. And we can, of course, spread Christianity. And so this is the debate we'll be looking at when we look at our DBQ project coming up. Uh, what develops out of this is an insurrection. The Filipinos rebel when we annex them in 1899 under President McKinley. Uh, this rebellion goes on. We call it the insurrection. Uh, but it's, for them, it's their revolution. Uh, and it starts about 1900. Uh, in 1901, President Roosevelt will take over after McKinley is assassinated, and uh, it's going to end in 1904 when Aguinaldo is captured. About 4,000 U.S. soldiers uh, die, uh, various large numbers of Filipinos uh, dying. You'll see different accounts and different sources saying different numbers, but there is a huge number of Filipinos that die in this. Uh, the United States also employs reconcentration camps because the Filipinos use guerrilla warfare to resist as well. And um, they all stay a part of the United States as a colony until 1946 when we're made independent by the United States. This is one year after the end of World War II. You can see here we'll take a look at it, this cartoon a little bit later and what this maybe means uh, in the future. You can pause it and take a look at it and read it uh, if you want. But we're going to continue on here to Cuba. Cuba is going to be allowed to be independent, but it's given protectorate status until about 1903. There's another amendment you need to know. It's called the Platt Amendment. And it basically says that it passed by Congress saying that no agreements uh, can be made with Cuba and other foreign powers because that may entangle them and endanger them, their independence with other countries. So they have to be free of any other agreements with other countries. We're basically going to watch them and be their babysitter for a while. Uh, the United States can intervene in Cuban affairs if necessary to make sure that things are being running efficient and uh, they have an independent government. Uh, they must lease Guantanamo Bay to the United States. If you listen to the news today, this is part of those negotiations that Cuba would like to see uh, uh, on their side fixed up. They would like the United States gone. We rent it and actually send them a rent check uh, since this point in time for that. Uh, and this is going to be used as a naval and coaling station for us. Again, Mahan speaking here. Uh, and uh, no access no excess of public debt. They have to be economically sound and stable. And or Senator Orville Platt proposed this. So this is the law that is going to be operating on uh, uh, controlling uh, Cuba for a while until they become independent a little while later. Uh, and it's during this time that we're, we're going to rebuild uh, and try to modernize uh, Cuba a little bit. And it's during this time the United States military is there heavily. And this is where uh, the during this time period the cure for malaria is figured out. And the source is figured out that it's mosquitoes. And they start dealing with mosquitoes there. And Cuba is really turned around pretty significantly during this time. In terms of Puerto Rico, in 1900, the Foraker Act is passed. Uh, Puerto Rico becomes an unincorporated territory. The citizens of Puerto Rico 
uh, citizens of Puerto Rico uh, are citizens of Puerto Rico, not the United States. Uh, they do have to pay in tort, port duties on the goods that are coming out of Puerto Rico. But the question comes up, is it uh, possible for the people in those territories to have full rights and citizenship uh, as anyone else since they're now part of the United States? Uh, does the Constitution follow the flag? And this was answered in a series of cases called the Insular Cases. Uh, the Supreme Court decision was basically no one, most all these cases, uh, that if they have constitutional rights in Guam or the Philippines or in Puerto Rico, that they are not automatically extended to territories when they're annexed. Only Congress can decide when they have rights and at what level they have rights. Uh, the import duties and taxes laid down by the Forest Direct are legal as well, and they must pay them. Uh, 1917, the Jones Act will be passed in regards to Puerto Rico. It's going to give them full territorial status to Puerto Rico, which is basically in standing yet today, and the conditions stand today. It's going to remove the tariff on goods to the United States. Um, Puerto, Rico's, uh, Puerto Ricans are enabled to elect their own legislators and governor, uh, but they're not able to vote for the United States president, and they have a commissioner that is sent to Washington, D.C. to vote for Puerto Rico and the House of Representatives and be kind of a voice for Puerto Rico in that sense. If you listen to the news, this is being talked about statehood for Puerto Rico, and they have some significant financial issues there at this point in time. Um, eventually, they're also promised uh, uh, independence. Uh, in 1900, uh, the colonial government was established while the insurrection raged there uh, at, uh, back in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines is also dealt with in the Jones Act. Uh, they're promised independence eventually in 1900 by this act, and they established a colonial government. And during that time, William Howard Taft was the uh, colonial governor. And again, you can kind of see us in a babysitting, taking care of babies kind of a mode and helping bring them to civilization and dip them in the waters of civilization. We're holding on to them and trying to develop them. This is why we're not letting them go, one argument. So when we look at the um, Spanish-American War, uh, did it unify, did it divide the nation? Yes, of course, we got the imperialist, anti-imperialist uh, uh, argument going on here. It does stimulate the economy. It does, in a way, kind of heal relations between the North and the South in the war. You can kind of see this little girl has Cuba on her little crown here. Uh, it kind of brings the nation together in the first war since the Civil War. This generation of Americans uh, really hadn't fought in a war before, even though there's a good number of Civil War veterans around uh, significantly. Uh, but it does have a way of kind of unifying the nation and, and stimulating the economy. And it brings us into a new mode of foreign policy. We are now a world colonial power, and we are in it for a while. Make sure you do your left side work and answer your essential questions. See you next time.